So welcome. The reason why we're here today is that it's very easy to feel confused and overwhelmed when you start searching for photos and you're never able to find the perfect one. So I'm gonna share with you some strategies that work for all types of photography workflows. And if you've ever lost an image or feel like you're at risk, you're gonna learn how to keep your photos safe and backed up. I'm gonna show you how to have access to your photo library offline without a need for the cloud. And so I think you guys will enjoy today's workshop. Uh, you're gonna learn how to set up a hard drive for a multi-application workflow. In other words, a structure that will work with all apps. You're gonna learn how to clone your hard drive each and every night so that you don't lose any data, keeping a second copy. You're gonna learn how to set up hard drives to avoid data loss and how the cloud can be used as a strategy to help you implement a better workflow. We'll also talk about how to organize with metadata, which is the type of data we use to find our files. And I'll show you some other things that include how to automatically use AI to rate and identify your best files with Aftershoot. And there's both a free and a paid version of Aftershoot. And I'll show you how to keep your devices in sync with Mylio, which also has a free plan if you wanna give it a try. So thank you guys for coming. My name is Rich Harrington, and I'm a visual storyteller. I've been working in the space of photo and video for many years. I also help design different software tools and do a lot with photography and AI. And I enjoy being both a husband and a father. Through the years, I've put out more than 40 books about photography and video and more than 200 full-length video courses through platforms like Kelby Learning and lynda.com and LinkedIn Learning. I get a chance to speak at conferences. In fact, I'll be hopping on a plane tomorrow to go to and maybe Las Vegas, looking forward to that. And uh, I also do consultancies to many television stations about their TV workflow. And I enjoy being both photographer and a video director. So through the years, I've had the chance to figure out a lot of different technical workflows. And if there's anything I figured out, I have a habit of either writing it down or recording it. That's because I wanna try very hard to make things learnable for people. So that's my goal. Okay, so I think you'll find that this could be quite useful. Uh, additionally, if there's something else I figured out and it's really organized, I tend to put it in a book. So I've written the first book about photography and video, uh, the first book about professional podcasting, and a lot of official books for both Apple and Adobe for their software. And to put it all together, I've got a background in project management, so I do a pretty good job of staying organized, but I've made more mistakes through the years, and I like to learn from those and share. So that's what I do. These are some of my companies. All right, let's get underway and uh, jump in. If you want to connect, you can reach out on LinkedIn. I'd be happy to hear from you. Okay. Here's something to keep in mind, and that is that the number of photos that we have to keep track of just keeps growing and growing at an incredible rate. So this is particularly challenging because it means that we end up having to do a lot. And so you can see here over the next five years, that the number of photos stored is expected to go from about seven and a half trillion up to almost 1.4 trillion, which is effectively doubling the amount of pictures that need to be organized. So this is meaning that not necessarily your pictures are going to double, but that many people's are, that overall, I should say, there's so many pictures increasing and storing that the amount stored is double and yours too will, of course, grow in size. So this means that we need to have a strategy because your photo library is generally only going to get bigger. So it's important that you have a good strategy. How much is too much? Well, how organized you wanna be is ultimately up to you. You're gonna to have to make that decision for yourself and you're gonna to have to make a good decision on what you think is a reasonable amount of prudence. I tend to be excessively safe with my images because I care deeply for them. Some of them are my professional livelihood and others are just precious memories like family. But you can decide how paranoid you wanna be 
but one single hard drive in one location is not a good idea. So what do you need to think about? Well, the least protected is a single hard drive. You get more protection when you add an extra hard drive that's backing up your data. So you have your data on one hard drive and a copy on a second drive. That's good. If you can add something like offsite backup, for example, cloud, well, that gives you a third level of protection and that's an offsite backup, which is good because you can have theft, you can have fire, your home office can be flooded. You know, for example, there's a volunteer organization I work with and they just recently had a flood happen on the weekend. It happened on the third floor. So it leaked down to the second floor, which then destroyed the entire floor that dropped out and smashed all of the offices on the ground floor. All of this happened over a weekend. You know, who would have thought a broken pipe would destroy two out of three levels of the office and dozens of computers and everything else flooded, smashed. These things happen. Fire, theft, knocking a Diet Coke into your laptop, all sorts of things that can happen that you don't want that can cause you to lose data. Another level of protection is to use a RAID, a redundant array of independent disks. So this can include the ability of attaching extra storage where there's multiple drives in an enclosure with some levels of protection. You can do multiple offsite backups or use a service that manages your backups. And we're gonna talk about all of these strategies today. If you wanna automate things, I really suggest taking a look at something like this. I use Carbon Copy Cloner on my Mac. Syncback Pro works quite well on Windows devices. And what you're looking for is the ability to keep your materials in sync and backed up. You don't want to have things disappear or get lost accidentally. So it's really quite important that you're doing this automatically. So my computers and drives automatically back up every night. That way there's a level of protection and redundancy that makes me feel safer and cuts down on the chance of losing data. So it becomes really important that we are mindful and do not lose our data due to carelessness. So automatic backup is a good idea. Now, there are other services here. Most of these are software apps. Backblaze is a combination. It can run locally or it can also run to the cloud. So there's something to be said there for using it as a service as well. Now, what do you do with these tools? Ultimately, you want them to back up. Let me stop sharing my screen for just a second. I'll just move this out of the way. And I wanna show you what this tool looks like. So I'm using Carbon Copy Cloner here on my computer. And every night it's going to create backups. So that kind of looks like this. Let me just drag it over here for you. That's a great utility. One of the ones that was on the list for keeping things in sync. And it looks like this. Let's just minimize this one temporarily and bring this one over. There we go. So every night, my main hard drive clones to another drive and it runs at 2 a.m. So it's really simple. You just say, I want a new task, choose the source, hey, hey, my hard drive, choose the destination, and then set up the schedule. And under advanced settings, you can actually add extra things like copy everything or preserve root level folders or run a verification check afterwards to make sure that it worked or send me an email, right? So it's pretty cool like that. It makes it really easy to know what's happening. Okay, cool. So uh, that gets you guys caught up on Carbon Copy Cloner. That's just like any of the other tools I mentioned, super duper, uh, Chronosync, there's lots out there. I'll put the list back up in a moment. So that makes it easy to back those up. And then I said, make sure that you work off of OneDrive 
So in this case, here's my A drive. And each night it clones to my B drive. And if there's any differences, it puts them in a folder to detect those differences so it's easy to see. So make sure that you guys are using something like that where you don't work off of two drives, rather you work off of one drive and clone to the other. That gives you that clean backup, okay? All right, so what I mentioned for those tools Carbon Copy Cloner is the one I showed you. Syncback Pro works quite well as well. And here's a handful of others. Is anybody else using a cloning software that they'd like to share in the chat that they really like? So if there's one that I didn't mention here that you really believe in for cloning your hard drives, feel free to toss it into the chat and let others know. It's a great way to keep your hard drives in sync and backed up. All right. How organized do you want to be? So there's a lot of tools. You can use AI search tools. Tools like Xsire work well for this, or there are other tools on the market that can use artificial intelligence to analyze your images and then add keywords based on that analysis. You could use detailed folders to keep things organized, clients and job numbers, tags and keywords, hybrid, all of those are quite good. Oh, good, we got some new suggestions in there. Good Sync, Macrium Reflect. Glad you like Carbon Copy Cloner, Jenny. It's really quite easy tool, isn't it? And they keep making it better, which is nice to see. Detailed folders work well. That's where you can use subfolders that are nested. You could put things into folders with client and job numbers. You can use tags and keywords to organize, or you can use a hybrid approach. So I'm gonna show you something that I recently did for a photo shoot that I had last week. And uh, let me share on this screen really quick. And I'll show you what I did. Okay, I'm gonna show you after shoot in just a second, but here we go. I've got a photo shoot that I directed last week. And so it was for Milio. They've got a new version of their product coming out soon. And we had, a uh, bunch of different subjects. So we worked with different folks uh, in uh, a couple of gentlemen, a couple of women, uh, folks of different ages. And so I organized them. Then within that, I used folders to describe the location of where they were working. So this way we would be able to see sort of their workflow of where they were photographed. Well, when I import those into my Leo and I added them to my library here, what I was able to do with the import dialog was tell it how to process that. So I'll just show you, I could say import, add media, and I'll select them here. I'll just copy these. I'm not gonna actually import because I've already done it, but I'll show you the option. Choose the folder. And then under advanced settings, I said, go ahead and add all the folder names to the keywords and keep my existing folder organization when I import. If I didn't wanna do that, I could also have it auto organized by year, month, date. And a lot of other tools can do that as well when you import, okay? So that's what I did to bring those in. And it looks like this. So when I go into that folder here and I go to select an image, you're gonna notice under the keywords here that it was able to generate keywords using it. Couch, the name of the client, the photo shoot, the subject. If I go to another folder, you'll see subject, other things. Now this closed eyes, that's actually being done by aftershoot, which we'll talk. I don't even have to look at this photo because her eyes were closed. Or if I had others that were out of focus, you'll see that it was able to actually use AI to detect pictures with issues. 
Now, the closed eyes might be okay. Here, it was able to identify that these were blurry. So it detected there that the focus wasn't nailed on this one. So it makes it simple for me to find the best image. And I'll show you how that was done here in a little bit. Okay. All right. Now I'm not working with the full quality files on this one, but I'm going to actually pull those down. Notice here with Mylio, I can actually say on demand, download my originals. Boom. And what it's going to do is connect to other computers on my network or my cloud library or to another machine, and it will actually start to download those and transfer them to this device. So on demand, you can switch and sync entire folders or individual images between your computers without having to use the cloud. We'll talk about that a little bit later. All right. So you could see there on import, what that allowed for was for me to turn my folders into actual keywords, which means that that gets embedded into the images and that becomes useful. Okay, we'll come back to Xire here. Let me see if it finished its removal. Nope, still going. Oh, it did, good. So let me show you what that looks like. You could say add and then browse to a folder grab what you want. I'll take this folder here and I'll say open. I'll include the subfolders. I'll tell it to analyze. I'm not going to worry about previews and I'll say start. So that'll get added in there and it'll start to process those. And so you can see the progress up here. And what it's doing is it's going to use AI to determine what's in those pictures. It also can start to generate keywords that get added. So you'll see here using photography terms, it's able to identify things like depth of field and different types of lighting. And it's also able to recognize the subject of the photos. Now this runs in the background. So we're gonna let that run and we'll come back to it in just a moment. And I'm now gonna show you another AI tool uh, in just a second. So you can see how these can get a little bit organized. All right, let's switch back. While we're letting that run in the background, let's take a second to talk about backing up. So one thing I recommend strongly is a three to one backup approach. That means that you have three copies of your data on two different types of media, not just hard drives, ideally two physical different types of media if possible, or at least two physical devices. So it's not good to put two copies on the same drive, for example. That could protect you against user error, but not against loss or drive failure. And ideally, one of those copies is going to be stored off site at a different location. <clears throat> now, you also want to clearly distinguish between the primary and the backup. That's what I showed you when I had my A and B copy. So the A was my working copy and the B was my backup copy. Schedule your backups to occur at appropriate times. I like to do it every night, but I also tend to do a backup before I clear any memory cards. And if possible, clone your operating system drive. So if your computer were to fail or go down, you could just quickly change it. I can also grab my clone drive. It's just a little tiny SSD and go, right? So here's an example of one of the drives I use for cloning. This little thing, four terabytes, super tiny, small, easy to use, really fast. I also use the ones from SanDisk. They work quite well. So Crucial and SanDisk both make very durable SSDs that are easy to throw into a laptop bag that you don't have to worry about any damage. They could take a dropping, they could bounce. They're really quite rugged. Okay. Let's see if Xire finished what it was doing. Almost getting really close. We'll come back to that. So again, how organized do you want to be? It's a personal choice. You could be this fine, calm person on the left who's relaxed, or you could be the stressed out person on the right. It's up to you. Now, 
I am super paranoid when it comes to redundancy. I mean, I'm going to show you just how paranoid in a second here, but I don't worry about things. I can have everything in my house go up and fire and all my digital files are in the cloud. All of them, 10 bucks a month. I'll talk about that in a moment. But I make sure that I also have multiple copies on site. So if a hard drive were to fail, I don't have to spend days recovering my data from the cloud. I have a backup copy right here, ready to go. And if something goes wrong with one of my hard drives, I literally just reach down and I can open up a drawer here and grab a new drive. One, two, <laughs> and a few that have already been unwrapped. And there's more in here. So if something were to go wrong with my RAID, I just keep a spare on hand, I could pop it in. This way, I don't have to worry about data loss. Because if one drive fails, I could put another one in and the hard drive will heal itself and rebuild. But if I go, oh, I'll go pick that up at the store. Oh, I got busy. Oh, I'm waiting for it to arrive. Not a good idea. It's kind of like toilet paper. It's not good to run out in the middle. So I just keep a spare around ready to plug in and go. You can also use big external hard drives. Folks at Seagate have some wonderful 15 terabyte ones now that are externals, $300. Not the fastest drive on the planet, but huge capacity and great for a backup drive. So it works really quite well. All right. This is a clean version of my desktop. This is what it looks like. I've, uh, this is a screenshot. I've hidden a few things. But this is my cleaned up desktop state that I try to get to each night, more or less. Let me talk about what's happening here. First up, on the left here, these pictures, documents, music, and video folder, these are all automatically managed. I use a utility called Declutter, which automatically scans my desktop and moves loose files into the right folder by type. That way I can just go in and clean those up periodically. I also keep a few other folders for things I'm working on, like business development, active projects. I'm just as bad as everyone else of throwing things on the desktop while I'm working on them. And then I file them away when I'm done. And that makes it nice and simple. I have my hard drive and Apple Time Machine. Windows also offers a backup utility similar to Time Machine. This is not great for backing up your photos, but is useful for backing up the documents on your application drive so that if you were to lose things like notes, project files, those are gonna be redundant. I have my Drobos and these are legacy. Uh, the Drobos are not something that's easy to come by these days. The company has not done well during the pandemic and some of the shortages, but mine are still running fine, so I continue to use them. There are other solutions out there, Synology, QNAP, lots of other ones. And uh, what each of my Drobos is, is it has five hard drives in it. And this is the instruction manual that comes with it right here. So let me hold that up. So it's pretty simple. If a drive goes yellow, like one of mine has, I know that the drive is getting full and I need to put a larger one in to upgrade. If it's red, I know that it's getting critical. And if it's blinking, I know that a hard drive has failed. And so that's really a big thing. There, let me hold it the right way for you. So it's really quite simple. It's so simple that my kids, if I'm on the road, can swap out a hard drive. They can walk past. I get email alerts that there's something going on with my system. So most of these utilities can actually send you an email and you could find out if there's a problem with your computer. This will help out quite nicely. All right, I see if there's a question, please just use the Q&A pod. That'll be a great way to answer them. So instead of raising your hand, just uh, toss the questions into the Q&A pod and I can certainly answer them there for sure. Okay. The systems here, I also have a big RAID that's a fast drive. This is what my video files are on, okay? So I see a couple of you are using the raised hand feature. You can't see me. It says I'm sharing. I see the screen. So you're seeing a shot of my desktop here, guys. Mac hard drive, Time Machine, Thunder Bay, Drobo. Okay, yeah, it's my desktop. That's what I'm sharing is a shot of my desktop because I'm talking about the hard drives. 
So a couple others say you see it. Seems like it's working. Let's check here. Yep. Okay. I'm not sure, Fred, but I'm sharing my desktop. Okay. Additionally here, I've got a fast SSD in here. So this is a cache. This is where the drives, the files I'm editing, the Photoshop documents and things like that, they live here. And then I've got things like my clones. So I back stuff up, okay? I do backup. So each night my hard drive is cloning itself so I can easily back that material up and if anything were to go wrong, I can instantly recover my hard drive. Okay, so three, two, one backup, pretty straightforward. Let's talk about that in a second, but I think XIR is done and I wanted to show you that for keywords. So did it finish? Yes, great. Here's what it did. Here, I just let it process a handful of photo shoots, right? So you can see things like eyes open, face, front to face, male, one face, person, teenager, young adult, right? Pretty cool. Glasses, bokeh for shallow depth of field, teenager, young adult, unsaturated, right? See how it's able to actually identify the content? It's pretty cool. Plus, you can see the other metadata about flash, single. Here, it's identifying three faces. So you could actually search on all sorts of things, right? Now, I'm gonna show you later that Milio can actually read these words. It's really kind of cool. So Milio has optical character recognition so you can actually see the content of any text in your photos. So if I were to do a search here in Mylio, it can read all of those keywords. So can Bridge, so can Lightroom, but Mylio has OCR, optical character recognition. So this allows me to search and find instances where there could be actual pictures that contain the word, which is kind of cool. So these words become indexed and that text can be searchable. Now, I'll show you that in a second. Here, let's just go to the eagles. Look at a different subject matter for a second. There we go. Animal, bird, eagle, predator, blurred, right? So it's able to add these keywords to the subject, water, lake. So I didn't have to, right? So AI can generate all of that for you. It's pretty cool. And Xire also gives you that ability then to say things like, I wanna do a search. I'm looking for two faces with adults. And I'd like them to have some male attributes with smiles. Great. Start search. Boom. It was able to find some. Now, in this case, it found two shots, <laughs> technically a three shot, but my wife is throwing her head back. So the AI missed it, but it found shots of two people where one of them was male with smiles. See? Versus Let's find teenagers and young adults with several faces. Don't care about gender. Do want smiles. Start search. No photos found. Let's try that again. Teenager, smile, search. Okay. Any number of faces, search. There we go. So it's gonna find those within the group. Now, if I didn't narrow that down, if I just went to the whole level there, that's where I should be doing the search. Now it's gonna do a little bit better. And I'll say, search that whole group for teenagers with smiles and group shots. Search the whole database. That's what I was doing wrong. Go. Boom. There's all the shots, didn't matter number of faces. I can say, okay, let's do that again, find faces. 
go ahead and focus on smiles and adults with several faces. Go. Boom. And you see it did the search for group shots. So this works quite nicely to narrow things down, but it's not about searching with an Excier because all those keywords are in there. Adult, face, female, male, group, person, profile, smiles, unsaturated colors. So it's kind of cool. And you're gonna discover that you could say things like find more photos. So you could say, look for more photos like this, start search, boom. And it found photos similar to that. Oh, well, that's a similar background. As I go in, I can also get more picky. And so I can start to look for particular things within. And so you could search on an individual face or you can go into other criteria and actually do pretty cool things. So I could say find faces here and let's do single portrait. There we go, start search. And then you can locate that and then do a search for that person. So it's pretty cool. All right, anybody have any questions that anything else, feel free to put them in the Q&A, but I hope Xire made sense to you on how you can tag and keyword things. All right, let's talk about three, two, one backup. Three, two, one backup is a pretty straightforward concept that allows you to keep your data in sync. So three copies, two backups, two different media types, one copy offsite. So what that looks like, three copies, one that you work from, and two additional copies that you do not touch. Two types of media, ideally two physical different types, SSDs and hard drives, a RAID and a regular hard drive. Think about that. So I use a more expensive RAID that has redundancy for my working drive. And then I have some cheap, really big hard drives from Seagate, 15 terabytes, $300 that I just use for backup. I leave them plugged in, but they're great for backup. One offsite, so you don't lose things. Now, ideally, when you load things in, you're gonna wanna transfer the material to your hard drive. You want to get the content in and let it be able to find the material. So it's ideal that you get that copied onto the drive right away before you clear your heart, your uh, memory cards. Also, the act of transferring can find corrupted files. If you want to learn more about 321 Backup, you go to photofocus.com, just do a search for 321 Backup. I also did a webinar recently with Milio all about 321 Backup, and we have the replay of that on PhotoFocus, and it goes in depth about backup strategies. So take a look at that. DP Best Flow is also a great website, dpbestflow.org, and it is chock filled with useful articles. I wrote several of them, uh, but this is a site by Peter Krogh, who is the author of the damn book, the Digital Asset Management Book. And that webinar, you'll find this over at PhotoFocus that you can watch. Okay, let's take a look here at a couple more things. I'm gonna to switch to my other device here. Let me stop sharing this screen. And I wanna show you a couple more things. Let me switch to my other device. And I wanna show you after shoot in action. Actually, I'll do it on both machines. So I'll set up after shoot to do a culling job. So you can see it. You just make sure it's running. Go, good. And let's switch. Go, one second. Share, share. Okay. So after shoot is pretty simple. What you do is you say you wanna add a new album. This lets you add in the pictures that you want to cull. Culling is the act of picking out the best pictures from the rest of the pictures. So it's this idea of trying to narrow things down a bit 
so that you find just the best, okay? Easy enough. And so that's its whole purpose, is it's able to cull and find the best photos. Okay, so once you add the folder, like so, just select a picture folder. I'll grab one here on my drive. Let's go here. Select the one that you want. One second. Like so. There we go. Oops, wrong one. I'll do it on the other machine here. Let me just switch machines. I'll share over here because I've got it queued up, ready to go. Then we'll come back here where I've got it already done. It's like a cooking show. You're going to see me set it up, then you're going to see me bake it. All right, let's try this. Yep, you're seeing it. So you add the album. Then you point it at the folder you want. You can grab subfolders as well. You tell it to import. And then you tell it what you want it to do. So you just click start culling and you give it some rules. What do you want with blurred photos? No blurred photos or a little bit's okay, like shallow depth of the field? How do you want to group duplicates? Little changes are treated as individual photos or be more aggressive so that photos that are very similar get combined. These first three look within a 30 second window. This one ignores time and is more aggressive. How many do you want to select? The top 20%, the top 10%. And how many do you want to highlight for social media? This highlights is an AI analysis of pictures that will do well on social media. From the advanced category, you could say, mark the ones that have closed eyes, look for blurs, and look for true duplicates. And you can assign stars, keywords, or color labels. Now, normally you run aftershoot before you import, but you've already imported into Lightroom or anywhere else, Capture One, or just the hard drive. You could still review the ones you have and tell it to overwrite or to skip overwriting color labels and stars and just add the keywords instead. Click next, look it over, decide how much processing power you wanna give it, low, medium, or high, and then click start culling. And what it will do is analyze the pictures. Now, the way Aftershoot works is it's designed to pick the best photo of each type. So for example, these two are probably gonna get grouped together. And then here, these are gonna to start to get grouped together because they're very similar. And it will pick the best one or two per group. The best 20% is what I told it. So it always picks a shot. So if you have a one-off bad shot, it is gonna pick that as being the best of that shot. So it's designed to pick the best of each pose or each burst. Now it's not just for portrait photography. So if you're shooting landscapes, like I do a lot of macro work, like with uh, flowers and close up details of things, sometimes there's little variations in focus. It will pick the sharpest shot. I've used it on eagles as well. It can pick those. And I'm gonna show you that photo shoot I did the other day, uh, as soon as this one's done and you can see how useful it was. So there we go. It looks at them all and it's gonna break that apart. What it's gonna be able to tell me is which ones have problems, closed eyes, blurriness, which ones are the best. And so you can see here everywhere where it says plus two, that means that there was another two versions like that one in there. And so it decided that those were very similar and that this one would be best. So I can come over here and say, hey, why don't you go ahead and show me all of the ones that have duplicates. Great. And only 
be five stars or higher. So I'll click, that's good and looks good. And I'll come over here and say, just show me the selected ones. Perfect. So now it's able to narrow that down and identify. And everywhere where there's a plus, that meant that there was others that were very similar. Now, in this case, it was able to narrow it down to about 60 of the original 180. But you can actually have it be more aggressive. So after you've done a cull the first time, you can be more aggressive. So that took it down to 32 now. So it identified 32 as being selected as the best of the best. But if I need to, I can say, you know what? Let's redo this again. That's great. Use the current AI. Go ahead and be a little stricter. And let's pick fewer to highlight. Go. It will quickly complete the analysis again because it doesn't have to do everything. It just reruns the rules and it will narrow that cull down, likely even smaller. There we go. And you can see how it reprocesses. Good. So now it identified these eight, and I'll say, show me everything, not just the ones with duplicates. These are the best eight that it thought would be good for social media because there's some humor, there's a little weirdness. These are the ones that's based on an AI algorithm that would score well for behind the scenes or just casual sharing. And these were the best pictures of that photo shoot. Now you can go in and check, remember, it doesn't mean that this is the best picture. This was just the best one of one. So when you have something that's a one-off, but it's gonna be able to go in and pick. And so if we look at this here, you can see, for example, let's open that up, that it identified each face. I can zoom in and look at those faces. I can use my arrow keys here to step through and review. And that's actually the one with the best facial features for this large group shot. Hit the arrow key and go to the next ones, see? And so it is able to identify eyes closed, not the best smile, that's the best one of the group. That one is significantly better, see? So it's able to find the best of each one. And when you're done, you just say save, changes and rewrite your XMPs and all of those get added to the actual metadata of the file. So let me show you what that looked like on a real shoot, just to give you a point of context. I'm gonna share this screen. And so I did that on the shoot that I did the other day that I directed. Let's switch over. There we go. And let's bring it up. Open. Just had it one second. Window, view. I'll bring it up manually. There it was. Don't edit it. There we go. Okay. So importing failed. One second. Albums. Here we go. Okay, so here I had 1900 photos, okay? A lot of pictures to start with. It was able to narrow those down quickly. Here's the best. Here's the ones that it identified as doing best on social media. And you can see it looked at each group and was able to find within the different variations between them. So this gives you that ability to find the best of each. Now, sometimes there's individual shots, but you can see here, it was able to identify. So if we look at these here, I can instantly go through and review. Now, if I decided that I wanna add one of these to the selection, like I really like this one, I can press A, that's the one it picked actually. But if I decided, you know, look, it blow away hair, it knew that that wasn't good. Maybe I like this one though, right 
let's see here. I actually like that pick. Let's go to the next one. Here we go. So if I'm looking and I say, well, that's okay. Actually, <laughs> it's pretty good actually with the AI. But if you do want to override, you can't. So the A key lets you override. Here's a good one. So here, the focus is on the device. But maybe I like this one better. I can press A, and it gets added to the selection. So the A key will add, or the S key will swap which one is selected. You can also manually change the star ratings to add it to the group, just like you would. Press the arrow key to go to the next one. And as you see here, it continues to find each one and give you the ability to just punch in and instantly check faces to make sure that the faces were sharp and identifiable. See how easy that is? So it goes through and adds keys, keywords, and it will also put in things like blurred or eyes closed into the keyword on the file, making it easier to identify. Okay, let's go ahead here and switch. Now, are there any questions about any of the tools we've shown so far? I'm gonna switch over to Milio and explain how I'm using that now to keep my library in sync, as well as catalog my tools, my pictures. Okay, so Milio is giving me a lot of flexibility and it is a tool that allows you to keep all your pictures from all your different devices in one unified photo library. So it runs on your computer, runs on iOS, runs on Android, Mac, Windows. So it gives you great flexibility. What you do is you can add all your devices. So you'll see that I've got many devices here. My laptop, multiple other computers. These computers need some more files. So I need to turn those devices on. My Mac mini, for example, is missing 11 pictures that are on my laptop. So it will keep them in sync. My phone, I just reinstalled and upgraded. So it's downloading fresh copies. My cloud backups, all of these are tracked. So you can see how it's working. You just click add and you can keep adding additional devices. Now, what happens is all of these are kept in sync across all of your devices. So for example, when I'm in the field or traveling, my iPad mini goes with me, or not my iPad mini, my iPad pro. And I have my entire photo library, 25 years of photography on this in a smart raw format that's enough to make a five by seven print or anything I need for a slideshow or social media. So Milio's smart preview files are going to take up just a fraction of the original space. They're about 3% the size of the original raw file. But I can go in and have everything. So if I felt like taking that photo shoot that I just did and not being stuck working at home, I could just jump right in and say, hey, let's go to that shoot to be organized there. And I'm just going to take that lifestyle shoot. There it is. And I want to start culling and rating those photos. There they all are. I can go through, review them, pinch to zoom, flip through, make changes, facial tag, everything else. It's all there. I also can access all my stars, keywords, tags, everything else. And I'll show you this on the desktop in a moment, but I want you to see how it's all right there. And it's still a raw file. So if I go in to actually edit that image, let me go to edit here real quick, edit. Look, there's still raw data. So if you need to check, can you recover the exposure, for example, look, we're actually working with the raw file. So I can go in and do things like recover the highlights or the shadows or the white point. So everything is in there, giving you full flexibility. See, I'm recovering the shadows. All of that is on my tablet. 25 years, 12 terabytes of photos 
shrunk down to about 300 gigabytes on my iPad. It's incredible. Mylio makes your entire photo library portable so it fits on your smartphone and your tablet without the cloud. Everything I was showing you works offline because it's all local. So I could be in airplane mode, like I just did there, and work offline, see everything with my pictures, have my entire photo library, share, export, tap the share button, I can access any app on my smartphone or tablet, post to Slack, put it up to social media, drop it in a keynote presentation, anything. It connects all of these apps together. With the update coming up, you can just literally copy and paste from Mylio into any other application on your computer. It's that simple. So it gives you the entire thing. Does Lightroom import into Mylio? So yes, there's two things there. So one, I don't like to use Lightroom, but I understand why you do. Mylio absolutely integrates with Lightroom. So they have a published service plugin. So that gives you the ability to keep the images in sync. So if you edit in Lightroom, they are in Mylio the way that they look in Lightroom. Now, the raw data, Lightroom's adjustments only work in Lightroom, but it looks like it does in Lightroom. So it gives you a reference image that matches Lightroom. So I'll show you that here on the desktop. Let me just show you what that looks like. So if I want to, I can select any picture and just say photo, edit with Lightroom Classic. And it will open that picture up into Lightroom Classic as a raw file. If you make any edits, there's a publish service plugin, it sends it right back, and then it shows up in Mylio that way. But it's not just about Lightroom, okay? Uh, Lightroom's cloud service, no. Mylio is different than Lightroom's cloud service, Brian. So the whole goal here is to not have to rely on Lightroom's cloud service, which gets really expensive at $10 a month per terabyte. So you're probably gonna have a lot more in your Mylio library than you would in your Lightroom cloud. But anything you put into Lightroom Classic can be handed off, okay? So Lightroom's cloud service is a pretty expensive proposition over time. Okay, I don't like to put all that in Lightroom's cloud, so let me show you what I have. First up, 12 terabytes of photos, okay? Everything's accessible, this is my laptop you can control how each device is synced. So I can say on my laptop, for example, under device quality, I can decide what quality it's at. Sync all previews. That gives me everything I need for editability. But I also have the tap to sync option turned on. So if I'm at home or on the internet and my other computer's on, I can take an individual folder and sync the whole folder. I could just right click right here, or sorry, just click right here and say, download originals. And it pulls down that whole folder of all the files off of my other device. I can go in and do that on an individual file. Click on it, right click, download an original. So you can pull down the original files automatically to your computer that simply without having to put them in the cloud. Now, Mylio does work with cloud if you want it to. So I'm using two clouds. Amazon's cloud, if you're in most countries, is free raw, and J, uh, free raw and JPEG storage at no additional cost if you're an Amazon Prime member. So I've put all of that up there. So that works quite nicely to keep everything backed up. And I also have Microsoft's OneDrive cloud where I store all of my smart previews. So that came with my Microsoft account when I got Microsoft Office. So everything is there. Now, Brian, you asked, can it be used as a backup service? Absolutely. You could have multiple vaults for backup or multiple computers. These computers are at my office. So if anything were to go wrong, it's there. Now I turned them off for the weekend, but when I turn them back on, they're gonna start syncing and downloading that data. So I actually brought one of them home. So when I turn that one back on, the computers will see each other and it will start to download the actual data. So normally my PC that I'm reaching over to power on would be stored at the office, but it's there. And so you just see that the razor just got detected 
And so now the razor is gonna scan the library and it will recognize that it needs pictures and it will start to pull those down to the razor as it needs them. So it allows them to stay in touch with each other. Now, I already have another sync going. So this one will start when this sync is done. Oh, no, nope, there, look, it started going. <laughs> so all I had to do is talk about it and it magically worked. So you see that it's now coming into sync. And I can take out my smartphone and see, oh, this computer is out of sync. Oh, my cloud backup needs to run. And it will even tell you what it's missing. So you can go in and check to see all of that. So over here, I could see, for example, that my MacBook Pro, let me spin that around, it's needing some pictures. So it's actually starting to download. So those are there. And I'll put that at the same plane. There you go. It's all right. It's actually downloading those devices. So all your devices are connected together without the need for cloud, cloud optional. So I do use cloud. I use Backblaze Cloud. It's 10 bucks a month. And I've got 112 terabytes of data in Backblaze at 10 bucks a month. If I wanted to restore that data, it would take like five months. So it's not there for convenient access. It's there for emergencies in case I were to have catastrophic failure. But at 10 bucks a month, piece of cake, super cheap, no big deal, right? Easy to not sweat it when it's only $10 a month. But Amazon Prime gives me free cloud storage. So I've got everything going to the cloud. So you can see here that that razor is just slowly ticking down. It's pulling down files. I've got other syncs happening at the same time. So this Dell is currently asleep. I'd have to wake it up or leave it powered on and it would start to run, right? And you can see here that Amazon is syncing now and OneDrive is syncing. These drives are currently not being used. I've got them turned off. So you can see what's happening there, how they all connect. Does that make sense? You're creating a personal network of all your devices, iOS, Android, Mac, Windows, laptops, desktops, and they sync. Can you limit bandwidth on syncing? Uh, it doesn't take a lot of bandwidth, so it's actually naturally limited, but there are some commands you could run in the console. They have some commands that you can pull down to make adjustments. Um, and you can control syncing on cellular so that it only syncs on Wi-Fi. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. Okay. And uh, I'm running a beta version here. They're going to be releasing a new update in a few weeks and some major improvements to some of the syncing speeds and some of the cross device syncing as well. All right, let me show you what this does. So right here, you can import old Aperture libraries into Mylio. So if you were an Aperture user, you could bring in Apple Photos, iPhoto, or Aperture. So you can actually bring those in and the edits are intact and it brings in the albums and there's my projects and everything else. And I can go in and start to see all that, right? So I've got all those pictures there from that past shoot. Now, I also have things from social media. So you can import from things like uh, Facebook and Flickr. So you just click import online services and you can grab from Facebook, Flickr, or Google. And it will pull down everything that you've put up there. So it leaves it there, but watch. Here's my entire Facebook collection, downloaded, organized by folder, trips I went on, pictures I never actually had that other people posted and tagged me in that were shared with me the correct way, that I had permission to do so, but all sorts of things, all there and organized. Some pictures I'd only posted from my smartphone, like this one I have nowhere else. So that was just taken and posted directly to Facebook, not even to my camera roll. So this allows you to keep everything in sync. Flickr albums, Google Plus albums, all that stuff is there and it comes down. When you're on your mobile device, you could be anywhere and you can say, share with Mylio, any app you're in and it will put it in your inbox. So here's my inbox. Here's some old photos that I was getting in text messages and I just tapped on them and shared them to Mylio and now, they're on my computer at home and they're backed up to my backup drives. 
So you could be getting messages like cool photos from your childhood. These are embarrassing baby pictures, folks, that I'm sharing. See, that's me on the couch. So <laughs> the, uh, these are now backed up to my main hard drive and library. So this allows you to share anything from your smartphone or tablet right to your photo library and keep it in sync. And anything that's in here can be handed off. So Mylio does have convenient editing tools. They're super straightforward. So they're very similar to what you would find in Lightroom. So if you need to edit on the go, you can edit raw files right on your mobile device on demand. And so it is straightforward. You know, you'll see easy presets, exposure, contrast, right? It's the light module. It's all the things you'd expect. So you can go in and recover highlights, exposure, shadow, et cetera, right? So you can make all those adjustments just like you'd expect clarity, black point, contrast, color temperature, right? So very simple to go in and adjust. There we go. Right. And I can see my before and after like so. Easy enough. Now, all those edits get synced to all my devices. So if I'm editing on my tablet, it syncs to my desktop. But watch this. Photo. And there's this open with item here. Now, I don't currently have this running because it's in beta, but open with is gonna let you hand this off. Let me just store these edits here. There we go. Perfect. Let me go back to the folder view. Now open with, let's see if it'll work here. Like I said, I am using beta. Okay. So that'll have a menu there that lets you hand this off to all of the other tools. Now. I'm working with beta version, but let me show you this on the smartphone. So if you are using it, you can hand it off to any other device or you can hand it off to any other photo editing application that you have on your computer. All you have to do is select a picture and say open with, and you can hand off to Photoshop, Lightroom, Luminar, Capture One, Topaz, you name it. Any picture you select can be edited on another device or in another application. So it's pretty straightforward that way. And it gives you that flexibility. Okay. So that'll be under the photo menu. Like I said, I, I pulled up a beta version here, so you can't see it. But what I really love is the ability to search. So Mylio takes my calendars and lets me overlap it right on top of my events. So I can see, oh yeah, that's when we went to Disney World. Disney World vacation is automatically attached. I can see events. Oh, that was that trip to New York. It found it. It didn't matter if I geotagged or not. If I just searched for New York, boom, it's going to find calendar things when I actually went to New York. And there's pictures on my calendar with New York in it. Or it can find things on the map. And now I can see all the pictures there that I've taken. And if I happen to take other pictures that day, those are going to show up too. Because not only can I see those pictures, I can say, show me everything else on the calendar from that day. So if you shot on your smartphone and your DSLR, doesn't matter if they're in two different places, you could see all the pictures from that date. So Mylio takes your entire photo library and puts it on a calendar. And if you had scans, you can add those dates. It also takes your entire photo library, besides putting it on a calendar, it puts everything on the map, like we said. So you can go in and search and find your pictures. And if for some reason, you didn't have those pictures tagged, right? So like I can go in and say, these don't currently have map data, but I know where these were taken, I can search for that. And so these were down near Stanton, Virginia. Boom, there it is. Drag and drop, confirm, and now they're geotagged. Or you can copy metadata from like a smartphone picture and paste it. So it's that simple to organize. So, and my favorite feature, is the people tagging. So once you start identifying who's in your pictures, 
it will keep analyzing your library. So in this one, this one's pretty tough. This was a recent photo shoot from yesterday. So I'm not surprised that he didn't know that that was my friend Francis. So I could tag those, but it's going to be smart enough to recognize that that's him. And so it will add that to the analysis. See, it now knows that that was Francis because I had already tagged him before and it retrained the AI that that was Francis. So now what you can do is start to look for people. I could say, hey, show me the ones that you've already identified. So it's going to bring up folks and say, hey, is this your son? You've tagged him before. And let's look. This one is my daughter. But all of those, yeah, those are all Michael. Approve. Boom. Now it's added. Is this you? Yep, that's me. Approve. And now those are tagged into the photos as keywords that are searchable by Lightroom and other apps. So other apps will now know that those are pictures of me. And you can see here how the AI, once you start training it, it learns, yep, that's Aiden. Yep, that's Justin. That's not Wesley. I'll come back to those. Those are all Luke. So because I've trained it before, it knows. That's all my mother-in-law. There we go. See? Simple. That is all my brother-in-law. That is all Emma. That's all my friend Joe. See how simple that is? So now all your pictures are organized by person. And you can even search. So you can come in and say that you're looking for photos of a particular person inside of an event. So maybe you had a folder shoot here. And you said, oh, I want to find pictures of Megan. You can search within or apply a filter within. Show me within these pictures, Megan. So let me go to that folder and I'll say filter by person. Find shots that had Megan in it. There we go. And within that folder, boom, there she is. Oh, don't do it for that folder. Come in here and search for pictures of Megan within the last, with this year. Or let's do the last 365 days. There we go. So there's all the pictures of my wife taken in the last 365 days. All right. Boom. She's in all these pictures. It recognized her. It was able to find her, even though I hadn't manually tagged her. So as long as you go through and you accept the people recommendations, now you can search. So Miley will let you search by people, by location, by date, and it filters it. Plus, you can go in and clean up your entire photo library to get rid of duplicate files. And you can even use optical character recognition to search within. So I like to take pictures of beer when I'm at a restaurant, so I remember what I had. So here it found all these pictures of beer, root beer. <laughs> but let's keep looking here. Here we've got a truck that was serving beer. We've got signs here at the, at the soccer game for beer. Here's some beer bottles. Here's another beer bottle. Here's Devil's Backbone. Here's this one. Oh, there it is. That's what I was looking for. Oh, here it found a video file with beer in it. So it's able to actually read the words within your text. This was not object recognition. This was text recognition. So it's reading within your photos. So it found my friend, Gary Paul Prince that I tagged, but it also found a screenshot of a tweet and a picture that I saved on my phone and a photo from Prince William Park. So you can actually search within your photos with optical character recognition. So I hope that this is making sense. I'm going to wrap things up here in just a few minutes to take some questions. But these tools all work together. So what's my workflow? Pretty simple. I bring everything in and I implement 3 2, one backup. That way, my pictures are automatically in three locations with one of them off-site. Milio does that for me. I bring it in, 
Mylio has multiple vaults. Each vault is a backup copy. There's a vault at my office. There's a vault at home. There's a vault in the cloud. That's on top of everything else. Then every picture I take on my smartphone, work on my iPad, anything else, it all comes in. Your camera roll from iPhone and Android automatically sync to Mylio. Easy. When you're on your smart device, if there's a picture you want to share, it is super simple. So you could take any of those pictures and with the tap of a button, just tap the share button on your device and you will have full access to everything that your phone supports for sharing. You can share to any app that your phone recognizes that easily, which is pretty cool. Now, besides that, I'm using tools like Xire and Aftershoot to analyze the pictures ahead of time. I'm lazy. I let it go through and star and pick the best photos. Mark the ones that are blurry. Mark the ones with eyes closed. Use Xire to add auto keywords by just auto analyzing my pictures. It's simple. All of that stuff just gets added to the XMP sidecar files, which contain information. Then I pour everything into Mylio because Mylio keeps the photos on all my computers and all my devices in sync. One photo library across all devices. And don't worry, it doesn't duplicate space. So if you're storing things on the iPhone camera roll, it doesn't make another copy of that on your phone. It just references the same picture. So it's not taking up extra space on your devices. But on my tablet, using those smart previews that I mentioned, right? This is all my pictures, all 25 years. 25 years of photography with that type of performance here as I scroll through. That's all my pictures, all 25 years worth of photography on one device. All of these are smart raw previews. So if I need to work on the file, I can. I can face tag, I can star, I can rate, I can pick, I can work offline. And everything I do modifies the XMP file, okay? So Aftershoot modifies XMP. Mylio modifies XMP. Xire modifies XMP. On one, Capture One, uh, Lightroom, Lightroom Classic, Bridge, all of those read XMP. So this isn't about one tool. So you can use any of these tools and all of them can see the data that the other ones do. So then it's just your choice where you want to actually edit. And for me, that tends to be Photoshop with some plugins. And I can hand off and do that. It's that simple. So I hope that this made sense. It really comes down to keeping your pictures safe, guys, keeping them organized. And if you do, then you don't feel overwhelmed. And I hope I showed you a couple of new tools today that make it really easy to do that. If you head over to Photo Focus, for any of those tools I mentioned, you'll find banner ads and links. They all have discounts applied. So if you wanna try any of those out, just click on those and you'll be able to try the tools out. And if you decide to buy, please click through our website you get a deep discount. So you'll save anywhere from 10 to $20 on your purchase, depending upon the tool. Okay. All right. I'm looking at some of the questions here. If you have any, feel free. Does Lightroom import to Mylio with adjustments? Yep. That's what I said. There's a plugin. It'll keep it in sync. Uh, we already addressed, Brian, that Lightroom's cloud is its own cloud, but Mylio can see everything that's in Lightroom Classic. And Mylio absolutely can back up to offsite locations. And I'm using Mylio for both commercial and personal. Everything's all mixed together because all my folders are in one place. So because everything is in there, it's super simple, right? So let me clear out the search and you'll see that everything's there. So for example, Let's go to the top level. Here's an old Aperture library. Here's some personal photos from my iPhone that I marked to save. But here's a project that I'm sorting. Here's a bunch of other ones that I wanna get organized. And when I get on the airplane tomorrow, 
I could sit there and organize my photos and call and rate, star, tag. If I decide to delete them, they're gonna delete on my hard drives at home. I could actually free up hard drive space. I can send albums and put them together for clients. I could go ahead and export and push them right out. So everything is all there and I can work on the airplane with no internet. Everything's on my device, okay? Can you use Milo to hand off to collaborative partner passing raw files to the editor? So you have everything and then you could share the whole folder um, to like another cloud service to share. Um, but Milio is exploring the ability of um, sharing entire folders. That's something that will come probably at the end of the year. So it's not designed for um, that type of collaboration with the cloud, but everything in Milio is just a click away, right? So if I just say download originals, and then I could just reveal and find her, you can drop the folder on any cloud service and they have it. Okay, so it's all in sync there. Good. Well, I hope you guys got some ideas. We've covered a lot of them. So thanks for coming today. But to your question, Brian, everything is there. So my personal photos, and my professional photos are all mixed together and it doesn't matter. I can keep them organized. Here's my scans from my scanner. So I've been loading up a bunch of old trips and digging up some of my concert photography. It's nice to rediscover these things. And while I'm at it, if I want to, I could say, you know what? Let me just identify. This is Prince. There we go. Create. I'll tag them one more time. Good. And now it'll start running in the background and identify more shots of prints in my library. That's all there is to it. And those are scans from analog photos. So it doesn't have to be a digital file. You can absolutely work with analog files as well. So Lightroom is your current cataloging system. You use export like Topaz and Photoshop. Uh, you don't have to use Lightroom as a cataloging system, um, but you can. Milio can read all the metadata, Junko. Just make sure you go into Lightroom and tell it to write the metadata to files. So instead of storing everything in your catalog in Lightroom, tell it to create sidecar files and then just add the same folders to Milio. Milio can hand off to Lightroom back and forth all day long with zero issues. So Lightroom is just a click away. And the benefit of Milio is that then everything syncs to all your devices. So you can have multiple Lightroom catalogs stored in Milio. Just add your folders of original images and you can have as many Lightroom catalogs as you want and everything will be accessible on your smartphone, on your tablet, on all your computers, it doesn't matter. It'll keep them all in sync. And if you leave your computer at home running, you can download on demand whatever you need to your devices. Okay. All right. Well, thank you guys for coming. And uh, please head on over to Photo Focus if you want to learn out more. My name is Rich Harrington, and I appreciate you checking out today's webinar.